All right, it's seven o'clock, so uh, let's start. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar on the status of Artemia cyst use in fish and crustacean hatcheries around the world. Uh, I'm Simon Wilkinson from the Network of Aquaculture Centres in, in Asia Pacific. Sorry, my camera's gone and died. Okay. So this webinar is facilitated by the International Ac Artemia Aquaculture Consortium, which is under formation. I think Patrick will tell you a bit more about that today. Uh, the NACA Secretariat would like to thank our expert speakers for sharing their time with us today. If you would like a copy of the program for today's webinar, uh, you can find it on the NACA website. Okay, if you go to enarca.org, ID equals 1164, or on the first page you, you will find it. And there's a downloadable link there. The last session of the day will be a question and answer and a survey poll. So if you have any questions during the presentations, please submit them via the Q&A box and we will answer as many as we can within the time limits that we have. You'll find a Q&A link in the menu at the bottom of your screen. So I'd like to begin by asking NACA's Director General, Huang Ji, to brief us on the purpose of the meeting. Uh, Ji, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, dear distinguished uh, speakers, audience, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks for joining the NACA webinar on status of the use of uh, archaea sites in fish, crustacean hatcheries around the world. Firstly, I would like to thank our um, immediate uh, Professor Patrick Soglos kindly considering the initiation of the topic and the excellent webinar programming of uh, uh, the International uh, Artemia Aquaculture uh, Consortium with NACA. Secondly, I would like to appreciate all our panelists' acceptance of the invitation to speak at uh, specific uh, presentations. Third, I would like to thank all our audience interested in registration and uh, participation in the webinar. We initiated, uh, initially uh, expected about 300 registers from this, for this webinar, but uh, the actual Register are uh, over 60, 600. Uh, I guess uh, in the late time, uh, during the uh, due to the uh, limitation of the Zoom meeting, may it may cause some of the register may not be able to join the meeting, but the webinar will be recorded and the video will be openly accessed from the YouTube web website with the consent of speakers. The goal of the, today's webinar is to discuss different uh, differences in practices used by fish and crustacean hatcheries in the use of artemia sites for the uh, preparation of live feeds. Over time, the practice used by hatcheries in Asia, Europe, and uh, uh, Latin America has uh, diverged from the good aquaculture practice for uh, Artemia production recommended uh, by FAO in the 19. 91 live uh, food menu. Today, our speakers, including technical experts using Artemia in the production of shrimp, freshwater prawn, mud and uh, mitten, crabs, sea bass, sea brain, and other marine fish from Bangladesh. Brazil, China, Equatorial, Greece, 
India, Spain, Thailand, and Vietnam. The program includes uh, introduction to the Artemia sized uh, hatching pro process and the crucial pa uh, parameters to ensure optimal hatching and uh, preparation of Artemia for use in the hatchery feeding of uh, fish and crustacean by Professor Patrick Sulos. Presentations on techni techniques for Artemia sites uh, decapsulation, hatching, umbrella uh, nuclei separation, cold storage, heat cleaning, freezing, and uh, enrichment used by small and large scale hatcheries from uh, around the world. And uh, the uh, question and uh, answer searching with the speakers. The webinar will produce the report with uh, spe uh, specific recommendations for the FAO Artemia workshop to be held at the Global Conference on Aquaculture, Shanghai, September 22, uh, 2000, uh, the, in this year. In addition, the web in, uh, workshop will contribute to preparation of updated recommendations on how to better use Artemia in hatcheries as an uh, important impu input for new FAO Artemia manuals, manual and uh, future training programs for local hatch hatcheries. I believe your support will make the webinar successful and uh, productive. Thank you all. Okay, thank you very much, G. Uh, our first presentation will be by Professor Patrick Sorgalus, um, and he's going to talk about, give us a short presentation on uh, the process of Artemia cyst decapsulation, uh, cyst hatching, umbrella nuclei separation, cold storage, and so on. Uh, Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you, Simon. Can you just confirm that uh, you see the screen? Yes, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate very much uh, the uh, facilitation of NACA. And thank you, uh, uh, Wang Ji, for uh, uh, making this arrangement that in the framework of the plans to set up a new consortium, the International Artemia Aquaculture Consortium, that we can have today a webinar specifically on the use of Artemia in uh, uh, aquaculture hatcheries. I think uh, everyone knows that Artemia is playing a crucial role in uh, the start feeding of a number of uh, crustaceans and fish. Well, uh, this was in fact not such an evident uh, situation back in 1976 at the very first uh, conference on aquaculture, I must say, and that was the FAO conference in Kyoto, where as you see, the brine shrimp Artemia was considered the bottleneck in mariculture, because at that time, there was only one source of Artemia cysts available in the market from the USA. We were uh, suggesting a number of possible improvements, and you see, and that will be the focus today, improved techniques for cyst harvesting, processing, storage, hatching, and use in uh, the uh, uh, hatcheries. Well, in uh, 1978, uh, at uh, Ghent University, we set up the Artemia Reference Center, and it was particularly thanks to the support of uh, a lot of research institutes, uh, I must say, around the world, who joined in the international study on Artemia to uh, uh, do um, a lot of first basic uh, research on uh, Artemia, uh, the different strains, the different uh, uses, uh, the different characteristics of its biology. And this resulted in uh, several books published in 1980, 1987, 
a number of manuals, the first one in 86, and then the one uh, uh, Wang Ji was referring to the FAO manual on production and use of live food for aquaculture. Um, in the meantime, this uh, 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 critical role of Artemia is well uh, recognized. And as you see here, we can still say today that the key to successful aquaculture is in, indeed uh, to uh, uh, see how, uh, how Artemia can assist in uh, setting up a predictable, a cost-effective, and a high-quality uh, production in uh, the hatcheries. Over the years, with the expansion of hatchery aquaculture, the successful developments in shrimp farming, in marine fish farming, we see that the consumption of Artemia has really increased quite quickly, is um, stagnating maybe now around the 3,500 tons of Artemia, because um, the dependence on Artemia is not as critical anymore in terms of quantity as it was uh, in the early years. Just to give you a figure, where in the early years, people consumed about 25 kilos of Artemia cysts to produce 1 million shrimp post larvae. Today, it can be done with uh, uh, 2 to 3 kilos uh, of uh, Artemia cysts. And in the meantime, we can see that uh, this has uh, resulted in a multi-billion US dollar industry, just the production of the uh, 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 fry and post larvae. And this ends up in uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, total production of 10 million tons of high quality species. So where initially uh, we were limited uh, because of the initial developments and the limited resources, but already as of the early 1980s, we have seen that a number of other uh, uh, strains and species of Artemia became available. Let me just spend a few minutes to uh, uh, cover a little bit on the biology of Artemia. And you will see that this knowledge is quite important to uh, understand some of the applications and maybe where we will have to realize that uh, some of this knowledge is not enough taken into account today in uh, the uh, commercial hatcheries. So Artemia cysts are in fact dried embryos, we call them eggs, but uh, the correct name is cysts. Uh, they have a very low water content, they are very hygroscopic, so if you leave them in the humid air, they will start to hydrate. There is zero metabolism, where initially we thought that it was a, a dormancy, a very, very low metabolic activity, it is zero metabolism. And as soon as they can swell and uh, hydrate, the embryonic development can continue. Another detail, but important to know, is uh, um, this is a cross section here of the shell of Artemia. Uh, the outer part is the dark brown colored chorion. Uh, then here inside you have the embryo and uh, uh, um, uh, outer cuticular membrane. And it is this outer cuticular membrane that has a very unique characteristic. It's like a molecular sieve. Uh, oxygen molecule, water, carbon dioxide can go in and out, but any molecule bigger than the carbon dioxide cannot get through this uh, molecular sieve. And it is in fact, when you will hear later about decapsulated cysts, it is this part, the uh, chorion, the dark brown part that can be removed in uh, producing the decapsulated cysts. So uh, when they are dry, it's like a, a, a flat football. You uh, uh, let them hydrate in seawater. And once fully hydrated and they become uh, spherical, a light trigger is critical, is essential in order to start that carbohydrate metabolism. And the carbohydrate metabolism is, in fact, a, uh, a, a decomposition uh, uh, of the three halos into glycogen as an energy source and glycerol. And glycerol, as uh, you might know, is a very hygroscopic uh, product. So the more glycerol is produced, the more water will be absorbed. And of course, uh, water can come in. As I mentioned to you, uh, O2 can come in, CO2 uh, can go out. So the content of the hygroscopic glycerol in the cysts will increase. That means that the pressure inside that cyst shell will increase. And at a certain moment, that osmotic pressure will result in a breaking, in a cracking of uh, the shell. 
And at that moment, very crucial and very important to recall is that at the moment of breaking, that glycerol that was playing that important role here in the carbohydrate metabolism is released in the hatching medium. And this glycerol is a very good substrate for Vibrio. So this is a cyst in the breaking stage. A little bit later, we call this the umbrella stage when the embryo is fully released from the shell. And then the hatching enzyme is released and the nucleus in star one, freshly hatched in star one nucleus is released. Schematically, we see it one more time here. In an hour uh, at room temperature, we will have a full hydration. That's the moment that a light trigger is critical to start the metabolism. And then we go through the process of breaking and hatching. In star one, in star two, with a very, very important difference that an instar one is fully surrounded by an ectoderm. And that means no functional digestive tract. It's a number of hours later, depending on the temperature, that the crustacean larva will molt into the second stage, the instar two stage. And at that moment, the animal has an open mouth, functional digestive system, and that means that it will filter out particles in the water, in the hatching medium. That means collecting and taking up Vibrio. Here uh, you see uh, uh, a coloration when you are using Lugol solution, you can easily check non-colored in star one, colored uh, in star two stages. I will not go into the details of uh, what is needed for good hatching in terms of temperature, salinity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, PowerPoint presentation will be made available. This is all the information that has been well documented in the manuals and in a number of other uh, operating procedures. I also draw to your attention without going into the details that today there are quite a number of different species and strains uh, available in the market. Artemia and Artemia is two. You have to realize that there might be differences in size hatching characteristics, nutritional value, etc. Again, no time to go into details here. Also important to tell you that there are uh, parameters, there are tools and techniques available to check on uh, the hatching quality, hatching percentage, hatching efficiency, hatching rate. Again, all well described in the different manuals. Particularly for this presentation, I'm showing you also this slide to draw your attention to the hatching synchrony the speed of hatching. So you might have a product here with a very similar hatching efficiency in terms of number of nuclei that are produced, but um, these 360 degrees are split up in hours. So halfway you are at 24 hours incubation. You see that in 24 hours, some have finished the hatching, others still have to start the hatching. So you see at the size of this blue-green part, the synchrony of hatching can be very different from one batch, from one strain to the other. To produce and use uh, the Artemia nuclei, there are a number of steps, and I uh, expect that we will see a lot of examples in the different presentations on how these different steps are executed in big, small hatcheries, fish, crustaceans, Latin America, Europe, uh, Asia. Cyst decapsulation is also a technique uh, that was uh, uh, described. So where you can in fact remove the outer shell and uh, either have a better hatching and start with a, a very clean product. You can also uh, uh, store the product upon uh, dehydration, which you can do uh, in uh, brine. Of course, I draw your attention that this decapsulation technique uh, uh, releases chlorine, uh, so uh, you have to think about uh, the, the health of the people who are doing the process and also the effluent of uh, the decapsulation proce process uh, can uh, cause environmental problems. I'm showing slides from uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago because I'm expecting in the presentations to see more updated uh, slides on uh, the systems that are used for hatching. I only like to draw your attention again to uh, the cleaning and the washing and the importance that we have always underlined minimal physical damage. Very important to make sure that when you are harvesting, 
the artemia nuclei, washing and cleaning them, that they should always be submerged, uh, as you can see in these different uh, examples. Now, I also draw your attention that uh, new equipment, uh, already 20 and more years in use, the so-called cross-flow sieves, uh, much more efficient in washing and uh, cleaning artemia. Finally, I also need to draw your attention to uh, what I uh, explained earlier about uh, the molting from instar one and in instar two. This is just a matter of hours, either in the hatching tank, or uh, it could also be when you have a long retention time in your uh, hatchery, the technique where you can do cold storage. And I hope that we will hear several presentations about the application of this technique of cold storage. This way you can guarantee to have your instar one stored for up to 24 hours in that first larval stage at high density to feed your animals uh, with the most nutritious uh, source of food. So in conclusion, uh, these are the different forms that are being used, the encapsulated cyst, the umbrella stage, instar one, and then uh, the uh, uh, enriched metanopii. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Our first speaker today will be uh, Mon Montekin Tamtin. Uh, she's director of the Samutsukorn Coastal Aquaculture Research and Development Centre from the Department of Fisheries in Thailand. Uh, Pam, please go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you, Professor Patrick Sotilus. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will talk about the status of the use of artemia seeds in shrimp and fish hatcheries in Thailand. Next slide, please. The data from Fish Import and Export Control Group of Department of Fisheries reported that the Artemia seeds imported in the year 2019 and 2020s are imported as raw material, which are around 634 and 482 tons, account for 14 and 12 dollar, million dollars, respectively, and clearly as high as 90% are imported from China, Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, with the small amount, around 10% from the United States. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This uh, slide, I will be beginning with different types of Artemia products using in the hatcheries, which will focus mainly in shrimp hatcheries followed by using of uh, Artemia seeds in uh, seabed hatcheries. This slide, uh, there are four different types of artemia, mostly using in a uh, hatchery in Thailand, clearly. And uh, the first one is the dry artemia seeds, which is uh, the traditional one. And uh, the second one is the raw material packing in uh, five kilograms and uh, per each bag, and it's need to decapsulate it before hatching and fed uh, to the animal. The third one is the dry shell-free artemia seeds. This is similar to the second one, but it uh, made from low quality seeds, which is unable to hatch. So after the encapsulation, it will dry and packing in the container uh, for the selling to the, the farmers. And the last one is the chill artemia instar one and two, which uh, the hatching instar one and two will be collected and packing in tray or a box. Next slide, okay. This uh, slide shows the number of shrimp hatcheries and grow out farms uh, which are registered to the Department of Fisheries in the year 2019. As uh, we can see that there are for around 468 shrimp hatcheries and mostly uh, shrimp, shrimp, uh, shrimp hatchery in, in Thailand. And uh, this graph expresses of the total shrimp post larvae production from the, the hatcheries of the year 2018 and until 2020 which uh, Pinyas Vanamai contributed to as high as 95%. The annual trims level production are uh, around 66 uh, billion NOPI and is, uh, is uh, estimated to be 33 billion of post larvae uh, produced uh, in hatcheries in Thailand. Next slide, please. And uh, this, uh, this uh, slide show you that uh, the using of uh, dry artemia seeds uh, in the hatcheries. And this is our, uh, we, we hatching it in a traditional way, like uh, put in the 500 liter tanks, contain 28 uh, 
PPT of a clean sea water. And the hatching density is around uh, one can, which is around uh, 400 or 450 grams uh, 400 and 450 liters and providing with aeration uh, continuously for 24 and 30 hours. And then to harvest, the aeration is stopped for 10 minutes before Insta1 will be harvested. The collected Insta1 will be rinsed with clean fresh water or immerse the larvae in the water for 15 minutes to get rid of uh, debris and uh, mucus uh, in the hatching procedure before uh, keep it in the refrigerator. And this uh, slide show you the different, in different hatcheries, uh, normally they use like a plastic tank or fiberglass tank and uh, put uh, the seeds of Artemia in the tank. And they have quite a similar uh, technique uh, among the different hatcheries. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is also show you the in uh, different uh, different uh, picture from different hatcheries that the no PI will go down to the tank bottom as the, they has the photo taxis uh, behavior and uh, they will uh, release into the collecting nets and after that they will uh, clean and immerse in the fresh uh, water for fifteen minutes before keeping the refrigerator. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, now they, they have on the, uh, have the modern hardware tool that uh, there is some company like uh, Zipart Artemia that when uh, they, they have, they can uh, use like a magnetic to uh, attack to the seed uh, shell of the Artemia. And then the, we get uh, the quite uh, peel of uh, Artemia in star one. And from the, these uh, traditional Artemia seeds, they will rinse the Insta1 with a hot water before fed to the early stage of the stream larvae, like a suya tree up to my seed one. And from my seed two up to three onward, they will not rinsing with a hot water. After, and also we found that some farm, they either use like a Insta1 so from suya two up to post larva six, which is uh, almost sale to the, to the grow out farm. And uh, they also linked with hot water prior to feed to the trim. And nowadays in Thailand, uh, they are not uh, doing the enrichment anymore. Just some last farm that they still do the enrichment technique. Next slide, please. Okay. And this is uh, the second one is the chill Artemia that uh, are produced by some private company in order to uh, it's, it's quite a convenience to the to the farmer, and uh, they produce the uh, they produce uh, this type of artemia from the uh, quite uh, low uh, quality, uh, low quality, both the low quality or maybe a good uh, quality of uh, eggs. But uh, they hatching it and uh, they produce like in star one and in star two, and uh, after that uh, they will pack in the in the tray. And for this one uh, is quite good because it can uh, have the quality is very consistency and uh, they have the consistency of quality and quantity of the Artemia, which led to predictable of Shimrawa production. And uh, for using they will rinse Insta1 with the hot water prior to fit to the early stage of the Chim larvae. And also for the Insta2, they just clean with fresh water prior to fit directly to the mycid tree. And uh, for enrichment, it depends on the demand of the farmers. Next slide, please. And uh, some farm, uh, we found that uh, they, they use the like a raw material of Artemia seeds and they do the capsulation in their own farm. Like uh, in this infographic, show you the procedure of uh, the capsulation with the common technique, five kilograms of seeds of Artemia we put in the 200 liters of fresh water. Then four liters of uh, sodium hydroxide is added with the uh, uh, aeration for four and four, five hours. But uh, they have to maintain the temperature. It's not uh, higher beyond uh, 30 degree. After that, uh, they will put uh, 40 uh, up to 50 liters of Corox in the, in the tank. After that, the decapsulation, Artemia seeds with orange color, will be harvested at least linked with a clean 
clean water and to no more the chlorine order is uh, disappear. After that, they will bring these decapsulated seeds to be hatched with a density of uh, two, kilo two kilograms in the tank that uh, uh, contain 400 and 400, uh, around 450 liters with a uh, continuously uh, elation around 24 hours. After uh, hatching, then uh, they will start the aeration before collecting and they will feed to the, the larvae. And the last one is chelfree Artemia seeds. Uh, they use the low quality of Artemia seeds that are not uh, hatching anymore. And uh, this, this type of uh, Artemia seeds is uh, much cheaper than the normal, normal one. And they also use sodium hydroxide uh, apply in the decapsulated tank. And then after that, they rinse with the uh, Clorox before dehydrated to the packing. When uh, they use in the quite a larger size of the gym larvae, like uh, from first lava five onward. Before using, they need to uh, rinse with the uh, hot water around uh, 70 degrees in order to hydrate the seeds and also uh, to make it soft and then uh, fit to the gym larva and uh, no enrichment in this method. Next slide, please. So for the enrichment technique, in, in the past, uh, Thailand produced a uh, penis monodon that uh, they're selling at uh, quite a larger size of pot larvae, like a 15 and a pot larva 16. So the enrichment is significant effect to the gym larva performance. And they use quite a long period of enrichment, like, 24 hours for the Insta one with the lipid emulsion and uh, vitamins. However, uh, at present, at uh, we know that uh, we have like a 95% production of vanamide, and uh, they are selling at uh, post lava 10, this is the shorter period. So enrichment is not uh, necessary anymore. It's some farm that like a large farm, they do enrichment, they just do quite the short duration like uh, they put a uh, vitamin and lipid dimension and keep the artemia in the refrigerator for only two or three hours before using. Next slide, please. And this is just some light of a feeding program because in, in, in Thailand hatcheries now, the what they use, it depends on the cost effective and also for the, for the, uh, the quality of the artemia. For the Insta one that I show you in the, the two uh, row is from the traditional uh, dry atomiasis. Normally they rinse with hot water at the early stage. And then for the larger, larger state of the post lava, they will not uh, rinse with the hot water. For the shoe atomia, they use like uh, Insta1, the same, they also rinse with the hot water. And for the bigger one, like Insta2, they just uh, rinse with the fresh water. And if the farm that use the chill free Artemia seeds, they will feed to the post larvae, five, uh, like a post larvae five onward and links with hot water just to hydrate and make it soft. Some farm they do also combination with a uh, shoe install one. And also uh, when the bigger, they use the dry seeds uh, and have in their own farm and fit to a post larvae six onward. Next slide, please. And this uh, to show the difference between uh, large scale hatchery, medium scale and small scale. For the large scale, they uh, prefer to use two Artemia Insta 1 and 2 because they can uh, control the quality and also the quantity as I told you before. And they might uh, use just some 10% uh, of traditional dry Artemia seeds. For the medium, they will uh, uh, use maybe 100% uh, of the traditional dry Artemia seeds. And uh, also now they use like uh, seeds from uh, China, especially in the Eastern hatcheries. And some, uh, they will also use 40% uh, of shoe Artemia Insta 1 and 2. But for the small scale hatcheries, they are still using uh, only traditional dry Artemia seeds. Next slide, please. And uh, this last slide, uh, in Thailand now, they try to reduce the cost of uh, sea bass production. So normally from the traditional feeding stream, they, uh, they feed uh, the fish larvae with lotifer, uh, archimia, copy pot, minced fish, and artificial diet. And they didn't, uh, nowadays they use archimia uh, only two days 
After that, they will use the zooplankton from earthen pond like a lotifer, moina, daphnia, copepod in the mixture in order to reduce the production cost. Just some farm that they use this, okay. And uh, finally, I would like to thank you, Mr. Somborsong, he's the chairman of Seed Aquaculture Club, and uh, Mr. Adun, the director, that uh, they provide some uh, information for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kun Pam. Our next speakers will talk about uh, the situation in Vietnam. We have uh, Nguyen Van Hoa from Canto University and Trin Trung Pi from the Viet UC Company. Uh, could you please start your presentation? Thank you. So hello everyone. Uh, to continue with uh, today's session, I would like to uh, present about the using of artemisic in uh, rotation hatchery. Uh, well, can you speak closer to the microphone, please? All right. Is it okay, Patrick? Can you hear me now? Good. Patrick? Still loud. Still very quiet. Very quiet. Yeah. Uh, because not only I uh, speak very close to my laptop, but uh, maybe they're not really very... Is Can you turn, the, turn it up? Can you hear me now or not? Very faint. If you're able to turn your microphone up, that might help. That's why I will try. Okay, that's much okay, better. Okay, that's better. <laughs> thank you. Is this okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, good. yes. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, to continue with uh, the session, uh, I'm going to talk about the year of Ativia and uh, uh, hatchery of protection in Mekam Delta. Uh, you know that in uh, Vietnam, we do not have Ativia naturally, and all the seed uh, products are coming from uh, different countries like uh, United States, Russia, China, except that the Ativia Vinchau have been produced in South Trang and uh, but uh, they cover only a few percent of the total requirement. And they are on different uh, prices because of their quality. Uh, and the um, hatchery owner or the technician will decide which brand name is suitable for their hatchery in terms of, uh, of the benefit or the cost effective. Next slide, please. So in general, uh, you can uh, see the incubation scheme in the hatchery over here. So we uh, uh, normally that we rely on the natural seawater or a mixture of dry and tough water. And over here, we uh, show up the way how they have prepared. Uh, for the dry or seawater, normally they are treated with um, one ppm. Then they go into the filter uh, before chlorination with 30 ppm and to add EDTA, 10 ppm. Again, go back to the filter and now it's ready for you. Um, when they uh, are in the incubation, uh, they are controlled un uh, under the standardized condition uh, in terms of the density of uh, incubation, the lighting, uh, the line density, we have aeration or hatching time, like Patrick already had uh, show up at the beginning of uh, his talk. And uh, of course, after the hatching, all the newly hatched uh, NAPI will be hatched, uh, will be washed out uh, by fresh water and immersed in formalin for 30 seconds at a concentration of 100 up to 200 ppm and re wash again with fresh water before going to feed into the larvae tank. Um, I explained that uh, normally that uh, most of the technician are at with the standardized condition for incubation, but actually um, some of the hatchery, hatch, hatching room with the natural light uh, come from the transparent brood have been observed. So you uh, can see the system of it here sometimes without the light condition, but in fact, it uh, rely on the natural light intensity. Next slide, please. Um, 
one of the unique uh, innovation of mudrat hatchery in Vietnam is they uh, have replaced the bracket rotifer, uh, the bracket rotifer, bracket or not, because they live with um, um, umbrella state of Artemia in John 1. Uh, normally, that you know that in the Matra Hatchery, uh, uh, it is very laborious when to produce rotifer, but it's not always success. So, therefore, after they found out that to apply the umbrella state, uh, it can help to produce Matra successfully. So, how to get the umbrella state of Artemia? Normally, we do with the same uh, incubation process, but I uh, up to 12 or 14 hours of incubation, uh, the umbrella stay appear, and then we can switch off the aeration. Then uh, now to do the separation, uh, like the uh, indication over here with the steering stick, then we can remove the empty cell up and the uh, umbrella stay go down, and after that they can be collected uh, before fitting into the lobby tank. Uh, this is just some photo uh, to see how the practice of uh, incubation of the stick in the mudrack hatchery and uh, the clip to see the uh, hatching process of uh, Athena. The first clip to show up that uh, how the Navdi has it out from the stick, while the second one just nearly has it. I think here that we can find uh, in mode of the hatchery. Next one, please. Um, another pro in the field, uh, the standardized incubation procedure also have been asked to apply, but uh, in fact, in the field condition, uh, the standardized condition is quite difficult. So therefore, uh, the temperature or the salinity may not in the right condition. Therefore, the hedging percentage Normally at uh, maximum 80 or 90% compared to the standardized condition in the lab uh, condition normally. Next slide, please. Patrick. Um, now, currently in the country, uh, there are some company they have uh, produced um, instant uh, Artemia, like Insta1 and Insta2, sometimes uh, even umbrella stay. And by uh, reserving in the, uh, they are reserving in the cool uh, uh, temperature of uh, four to eight degrees Celsius, uh, and they can serve up to forty-eight hours. Next slide, please. So this one is uh, suitable for the large scale operation of uh, the hatchery uh, for crustacea or five fish. Uh, a, they are ready product and uh, on demand they are good uh, hygienic condition and very economic product. So uh, I prepare just a few more slides because with the fee from Vigo company going to present what exactly that in the modern hatchery in Vietnam they have applied for the seed incubation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. P, could you please uh, start your presentation now? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. For at all, I would like to thank you for your attention here to share how I can receive to current you in Group Hatchery. My name is Jin Trung Hui. I'm a technical director of the Oak Seafood Corporation from Vietnam. I'm here at their Universal Studios. We hope cooperation has already built public value chain of bracket water stream, and we are aiming to develop up of bagasseut industry in future. Next slide. Uh, we entered public the fourth hatchery 20 years ago, the year 2001, and after 20 years for operation, we now have a nice hatchery reaching from the north to the southern of Vietnam. It's a year we supply to Vietnamese markets from 15 to 20 billion dream ships. We are accounting for over 20% over market share. 
pour out demand on the atomic ship. We use uh, 60 to uh, 80 ton of atomic ship per year. And depending on the size of each hatchery, the daily consumption, the atomic ship can vary from uh, 30 to 100% uh, kilo per unit. Next play. Next play, please. The ship as technology has been applied by us since 2013 and has been continued improved for the past seven years with support from an EV technician. The liberation of the sale from Atamia has helped us to control the quality of Atamia in a bad way when putting it into you. Next slide. Uh, well, for the optimizing uh, of a hatching project and uh, facilitating of a harvesting project, we have a tactic to make considerable change from uh, our atomic production group. For the hatching, we improve uh, our light, BS, and temperature controlling system. For optimized harvesting, we change to high of the tongue from a row. 10 capacity and 10 number user history improve our work workforce. And I would like to discuss more detail about uh, that trend later on. Um, for a meeting visualization of the Atomy production room, we are op open writing and uh, our workforce. I would like to take one of our unit, Bạc Liêu Dream Hatchery unit, where 100 kilograms of chip are consumed per day at the model. In Dream Hatchery unit contain two Atemia product drum. Each drum contain 20 hatchery tons with a capacity of 2,500 liters and 6, 6 TM tons for head uh, Harvesting. One technician and three worker required operation bottom at the same time. For the work floor, we will conduct three incubation at three different times of, of the day. Uh, 3 a.m., 9 a.m., and 3 p.m. And harvest after 23 hours after that. Atemia normally after harvest are quickly packaged and revert to 43 cereals. For quality assurance of Atemia normally, Atemia ship back our book the very first in the laboratory where we check the number of normally, the, we make sure the number of in time one in greater than 80% and in the two left under uh, 20%. But now some uh, few months ago, we can check uh, only two or five percent of the uh, in that two. So we quite good with uh, our protocol now. And battery are but uh, battery uh, nice. He also check. Then Atomia now play part to transfer our hatchery where dream of four times a day with the hour in right interval. For intent in the big timeline, dream of six o'clock, 12 o'clock, 19 o'clock, and 24 o'clock. Uh, next slide. For hygiene, the water supply from both Atomia production room and dream hatchery. We pass through an automatic multi step treatment to ensure a type of solidity with a 30 ppt and be added to uh, add bond two. Sodium bicarbonate is used to control alkalinity within a range from uh, 140 to 160 ppm. After harvest, the tongue by third. Clearing the meter above, 
and lead infection by chloride to uh, to percent and sure that we know my micro uh, next slide so I want to share more detail about a change we made to optimize and the incubation and harvesting project. In the incubation, uh, we get daily density from a 2 to 2.5 uh, gram per liter. It's quite good for us now. And the light intensity on way keep high end to uh, 3000 lots. Uh, with about a hatching dry of atemia chip to increase maybe increase 19%. The light sources we use a sunlight using a sun drop and uh, 50 watt LED light. The room temperature is controlled using the cooling bath system. So that why stay between 77 to 30. We have to maintain about 7.6 at on time. So the first, before we uh, hatching, we uh, book uh, with uh, 90 BBM of a sodium hydroxide, uh, 95%. Uh, at the start, as the start maybe increase to uh, be at with a 9 bond S. So with a 9 bond S, we, we uh, after 20 hours for hatching, uh, never allow uh, lower uh, 7.6. So we don't need to put all the time uh, and the uh, worker easier to take care. In the harvesting, firstly, we use a large capacity hatching tank from uh, 300 liters before with uh, 150 ton. Now we move to only 2,500 liter ton and they do a number only 20 tons per uh, production room. So uh, this help to reduce the workforce. But the, the why we need eight worker for the uh, atom eruption in the hatchery unit. Uh, but now we only need four worker. Secondly, the tank slip to make easier transfer atom from a hatching tank to a CTM tank. And, uh, this, uh, this slide, um, here we, uh, we have an uh, image where the, we have a ship at your CTM. At the time of ha uh, everything, we turn off the aeration molecules five to seven minutes. After that, we select activity from the bottom of the incubation tank, more like uh, 15 to 20 minutes to open a bottom valve. Atom are in then transfer to the mesu tank. We can check how, how many number of nup, uh, nupli in the, the, the every tank. So we can make sure the, 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 when we, we, we check uh, the quality of atomia. Where after that, where we separate the water and pick up the bath to immediately reserve to the temperature for for disease cellular, and we can use eye or sun before we transfer to our dream hatchery. And this is also the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention attend to our hatchery system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. P. Uh, next up from India, we have uh, Nageswara Rao. He's from the All India Shrimp Hatcheries Association and has 25 years experience in shrimp hatchery operation and management. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Simon. Namaste all the participants and the speakers. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So before starting my presentation, I pose a question. Why Artemia uses in shrimp hatchery? Region? Because of its high nutritional content, UFA, this is mostly subsists on the yolk. And second thing is, this Artemia is a preferred prey for the shrimp larvae. And third most thing is, more in, in, uh, intrinsically, most of the crustaceans have the cannibalistic nature. To satisfy the cannibalism, 
we can give the artemia as a preferred prey so coming to the indian status of hatcheries we have total number of hatcheries are 401 out of the two hatcheries are for spf p monodon hatchery rest all hatcheries are permitted to produce l1 mi seed production and the total brood stock imported in the 2020 around 2000 250000 brood stock next slide so coming to our indian history of the shrimp hatchery operation in the before 1988 we have no commercial hatchery after that empire established one hatchery in tas park that is in vishakhapatnam coast one in os park that is in gopalpur before that most of the farmers are depended on the wild seed that time there is no use of using artemia after establishing this commercial hatcheries and they have they mentored and uh, extended their technology for many of the private hatcheries now india is one of the largest producer of shrimp sheep and one of the uh, largest producer of farmed ornamental shrimp so last year in the 2020 we have produced 70 billion of shrimp sheep and 30% considered as a bonus and the total gross production if you consider it, it is around 90 billion because farmers while transporting they have some mortality to compensate the transport mortality and acclimatization mortality normally this is the practice up to 20 to 30% are given to the farmers in addition to the net amount estimated artemia consumption is around 300 325 to 350 metric tons per annum all together and feeding artemia starts from joya 3 onwards most of the artemia source is coming from great salt lake uta gsl the number of feedings it depend from hatchery to hatchery and technician to technician is almost around 3 to 5 numbers average artemia consumption per million is almost 3.5 to 4 kg on and average 3.8 kg next is this is the typical hatchery setup in the indian system most of the hatcheries are having roof lighting system to enhance the illumination and they are about the 30 centigrade 30 deg- centimeters above the surface of the hatching tank they have the illumination the some hatcheries are only having without any natural uh, this thing some hatcheries are following only artificial illumination around 2000 to 3000 lakh so, next slide please so source most of the people hatching process most of the people uh, are selected the gsm oh you oh em bây giờ mình có 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 GSL is a preferred product because of its ease of use and consistency and the average hatching percent is considered more than 80% because indian people more hatching means consider more quality and the bacterial loads also less preferred and the color of the artemia biomass is preferred mostly orange that is it indicates the rich pigmentation next slide please and the decapsulation and the disinfection most of the hatcheries are following the disinfection procedure up to 5 minutes usually all the artemia cans are coming in 425 grams to 454 grams so before disinfection 20 liters of water taken clean sea water and 2000 ppm of bleaching powder are used for up to 5 minutes decapsulation the de- disinfection for for disinfection purpose bleaching liquid chlorine formaldehyde chlorine dioxide iodine are being used for decapsulation very some hatcheries are following uh, decapsulation that is up to 15 to 20 minutes bleaching powder and the liquid chlorine are being used regularly to remove the chemicals thorough rinsing of the cyst after decapsulation is very much required any traces will hamper the hatching this is the various process of decapsulation and disinfection next slide hatching coming to the hatching hatching tanks are cylindrical tanks and 500 liter capacity cylindrical shape and bottom we have a translucent conical shape bottom and with a tap wall to control the water flow and pvc stand pipe is being used in the center in order to prevent the trapping of the cyst accumulated in the center of the dead corner stocking density which usually we go for 1 gram per liter and the year it is most important point is filtered and most sterile uh, sea water is being used for the hatching if the water itself is contaminated after uh, hatching starts artemia hatching lot of vibrio loads we can find that's why this is filtered and very much sterile clean sea water is very much required 
and for that 1000 to 2000 lux of lighting illumination artificial illumination is provided above 30 cm of the surface of the hatchery oxygen supply continuous say, oxygen supply is provided to suspend the artemisis and temperature 28 to 32 degrees is being maintained and periodical wiping is very much important because once cysts are hydrated they tend to cling to the surface uh, peripheral surface of the tank once they settled on to the surface uh, the suspension is reduced and hatching percentage is also affected that's why periodical wiping and steering is very much important additionally probiotics depending upon the spore count 5 to 20 ppm chlorine dioxide 2 to 5 ppm ozone 300 to 300, 350 orp infusing into the hatching fluid significantly reducing the bacterial loads and slightly improving the hatching percentage next slide coming to the harvesting before harvesting this is the typical uh, uh, artemia section with uh, conical bottom with the four leg this is the clean sea water this is the incubation setup this is the vigorous aeration next slide coming to the harvesting it is uh, it requires a lot of skill and a lot of patience also. So in order to get the maximum output from the hydrated seeds. Uh, before going for the etching, so we need to stop the aeration and remove the standpipe. Once we remove the standpipe, the cysts are separated into three parts. One is empty shell, one is the hatched out freshly embryo, and the third one is the unhatched cyst. Unhatched cysts have the more weight, because that's why it settles into the conical bottom. And this all uh, all the empty shells coming to the surface because they are lightweight, and all the hatched out freshly hatched out artemia suspend in the water column. Next slide, please. So before uh, commencing the harvesting, we need to uh, completely darken the surface in order to prevent the photoactivity of the anoplet towards the surface. Here, as we discussed earlier, conical bottom is there in the. Uh, uh, bottom of the uh, artemia tank. Here, additionally, we are providing the lighting to attract the artemia nopla as soon as possible because here there is no aeration, oxygen problem might happen and nopla also will get affected. That's why we provide the additional lighting to attract the artemia nopla as soon as possible. Once the artemia cyst is removed, unhatched cyst is removed, then the artemia nopla starts coming out. Then we will go for the 2C method. This is one is the 180 micron. This under one is the 100 micron. So artemia hatched out all in artemia can pass through the 180 micron. All the unhatched is retained in the 180 micron. This uh, 100 micron is to collect the uh, passed out uh, artemia nopla. Once artemia is coming into the 100 micron net, it is thoroughly rinsing with the clean seawater to get rid of the all the hatching fluids, bacteria. Or, whatever it is, only clean nopla retains. After getting the clean nopla, artemia nopla, we go for biomass weighing and hatching percentage. Once it is confirmed, then it is holding for the feeding. Next slide. This is post ROC handling. Artemia nopla are inoculated in, with some probiotics in order to reduce the bacterial loads. So depending upon the spore count and mode of action, you prefer 10 to 20 ppm of uh, probiotics and so recently, some people are using bacteriophages. So they are mostly affect on the Vibrio control, that is 5 to 10 ppm. And some people are treating with the powered and iodine, 20 to 30 ppm to reduce the or control the bacterial loads. For Zoya and Mycestase especially, they cannot catch the active and agile artemia nopla. That's why we need to inactivate it. For that, either we need to choose the heat, inactiv heat inactivation or killing or frozen. So some people are following heat inactivation, some people are uh, following frozen. For heat inactivation, 100 degree boiled hot water to ensure biosecurity. If there is any bacteria is there, that also can be reduced. And a proper inactivation of the artemia and, so, and stored in the minus 20 degrees. From post larvae onwards, live artemia are fed directly from the holding tanks at room temperature. Uh, sometimes some people are using this enrichment with uh, micronutrients like vitamin, mineral, and amino acid mix and uh, probiotics to complement the existing artemia nopla. Next slide, please. Conditions influencing the artemia hatching output. Most crucial parameters are temperature. 
high temperature fluctuation between day and night. Since the tanks are very small, we cannot establish the individual thermal control. It is cost effective for the uh, in, uh, operator. That's why we naturally we depend on the natural temperature. Especially in the winter season, diurnal fluctuation is very more. That is impacting the etching percentage. Sometimes light fluctuating in the day and night situation. Some daytime, some people are using daylight along with the natural uh, artificial light. Some people only depending upon the artificial light. So that's why lighting fluctuation is also observed. And control of the pH also. As the etching is proceeding, some pH fluctuations are observed. And biosecurity, biggest threat in the Vanami hatchery is the, for uh, any other regions, this is a uh, Vibrio. So in order to avoid that Vibrio, we need to take the utmost precautions before hatching and after hatching also. The hatchery technicians, availability of the skilled labor, because it requires a lot of skill and patience. So this is one of the problem or uh, considering. Next slide. This is the Artemia feeding to the rearing tank, the LRT. This is a total feeding we can divide based on the size and uh, uh, age of the post larvae. And the daily ration will be divided into the daily uh, number of feeds. This is mostly preferred in the alternative feeding. One feed, art particulated feed followed by the Artemia feeding to in order to improve the larval quality and digestive capacity. This is the freshly harvested, uh, freshly fed uh, larvae, this is the normal. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, before concluding, I need to give a few things, sir. This Artemia, live Artemia is uh, agile and improves the seed quality and the robustness of the overall seed quality because Artemia is very active when compared to the simple larvae. In order to catch that uh, Artemia nopla, that larvae tends to swim very fast by, by that nature. Uh, that uh, Artemia, this uh, shrimp shield becomes very robust and the overall quality also improves. Recent developments of using chlorine dioxide, some people are using ozone, some people are hydrogen peroxide, reduces the bacterial loads in the hatching tanks and slightly improves the hatching also. So timely feeding to conserve the maximum yolk reserve is the main consideration. And one more point is responsible use of the limited and the natural resource of this Artemia by using the latest techniques and good care to improve the etching efficiency. And uh, most of the people after getting the 80% of the etching, 20% unhatched seeds are discarding. For that also, we need to take some protocol to better utilize the total Artemia biomass. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, next up from Bangladesh, we have Mizanur Rahman from the Artemia for Bangladesh EU project. And he's going to talk to us um, about shrimp and prawn production. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Mizan Roman. I work for World Fish and leading EU funded Artemia for Bangladesh project. I will be talking on Artemia cyst hatching and application in shrimp and prawn hatcheries. So, number of shrimp and prawn hatcheries in operation in 2021 is a 56. Penis monodon hatcheries. Uh, in Bangladesh, there are southeast and southwest. 25 are located in Kulna region and only six macrobrachium hatcheries. Three SPF monodon hatcheries in Bangladesh, two are located in Coxabada, one in Kulna. Number of wild brood stock harvested per year from the Bay of Bengal for penis monodon is 10 to 15,000 and 3,000 for macrobrachium from the rivers. Annual Simple production is about 10 to 14 billions and 30, and 30 million for prawn PL. The wild broodstock are fed squid, mussel, cow liver, crab meat, and SPF shrimp broodstock fed mainly polychaete, squid, creed, which are imported, and cow liver and artificial diet. Amount of Artemia seed Bangladesh imported per year about 50 metric tons, and there are no locally produced Artemia seed biomass till 2020 before this EU project started. Problems with Artemia is in, it is completely import dependent, increasing price every, every year, occasionally low quality seeds are available and Biblio contamination with the nuclei. Next slide, please. So, Patrick, can you move the slide a little bit up so I cannot see the bottom part? I, yeah, little bit uh, smaller size that, so I can see the whole slide. Yeah, 
Sorry, oh. sorry, Miss Anur, I cannot change. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So maybe I can do. Uh, all right. So for RTMA assist hatching procedure in the hatcheries is RTMA imported in Bangladesh mainly in the cans. Then it's is a cyst hydration and then a disinfection and the bleaching powder, then disinfection and hydration and rinsing and then washing. Next slide, please. And then uh, before cyst is incubated, the, the seawater is uh, treated and filtered, and then uh, seawater is uh, heated to get, go to the optimum temperature. Temperature is checked, but the RTMA hatching room in different hatcheries are different conditions. Uh, there are not really standard conditions and it can be varies with the temperature. It can be varies with the lighting conditions. Also the cleaning and uh, procedures are varies with the different hatcheries. Thank you, next slide. So once the RTMA cysts are incubated, then after 24 hours not, are not really harvested. Uh, some hatcheries use light in the bottom, some may not because then after certain time, the cyst rot so they can collect. Then the unhatched cysts are separated by double, double sieve technique and the double sieve technique, you can see the unhatched cyst and then the, the nauplia is hard rinsed. Thank you, next slide please. Artemia cyst hatching procedure, uh, then it is the, the Artemia nauplia before it going to the larval rearing tank, it is treated with the disinfectant chloramine, the hydrogen peroxide, formalin, in some cases antibiotics, probiotics, vitamin C. The practice of Artemia hatching really needs to be standardized to, uh, to ensure the efficacy according to the purpose. Next slide, please. The constraints in Artemia hatching in, is, in the is, uh, hatcheries in Cox's Bazaar is that the temperature is really a uh, difficult control in summertime. In the winter time, you can reheat it, but in the summertime, the temperature can really go, go uh, uh, go beyond uh, the optimum level. In general, hatching incubation period is 24 hours, so they re really doesn't follow that whether it is in star one or in star two stage. So lack of observation of Artemia nauplii, which in star one, which in star stages they are harvesting. And Artemia nauplii external washing with the chemicals might not sufficient to reduce, reduce the bibrio load in the larval rearing tank. And there is lack of practice of Artemia nauplii preservation before it goes to the larval rearing tank. Next slide, please, Patrick. So in 2020, you funded Artemia for Bangladesh project has been launched. So as a part of the activity of the project, uh, the, uh, the project imported uh, Artemia Franciscana bin chow strain from Vietnam, and then Artemia nauplii harvested at Inestor 1, and you can see that Artemia nauplii before it goes to inoculation, Artemia nauplii inoculated in the pond, then art, uh, there are Artemia seeds produced and raw Artemia seeds, which has been stored in the saturated brine. Next slide, please. Then we are, the project has been successful in producing Artemia biomass, and you can see the biomass, this alive Artemia biomass was supplied to the shrimp hatcheries, and then the, there are the remaining uh, this biomass also kept frozen, which can be used later on in the hatcheries. Next slide, please. The summary of the presentation is the shrimp and prawn hatcheries in Bangladesh are dependent completely on imported expensive Artemia cyst. Importment in Artemia cyst hatching procedure, no free storage is required for better management of the hatcheries. Locally produced Artemia cyst and biomass will reduce import dependency, open the scope for increased in income of the soil farmers. Next slide, please. So I really acknowledge the project staff who has been contributed for the progress of the Artemia production in Bangladesh, also Patrick Sarglos, uh, Professor Hua from Vietnam, and the Shim Hatcheries in Bangladesh, who has been helping and cooperating with the project and also helping us in providing the information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Uh, next up from China, we have uh, Li Ying Sui, who is director of the Asia Regional Artemia Reference Center and vice dean of the College of Marine Science and Engineering, Tianjin University of Science and Technology, and Song Gao from the China Artemia Association. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for your introduction. Um, now I would like to share you some information on the use of Artemia cysts in the hatchery in China.
Uh, I'm sorry, your microphone is muted. Hello? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So um, um, the aquaculture production in China has accounted for uh, two thirds of the global uh, aquaculture production. So it's not a surprise that China has the, world, the, the world's largest market demand. China annually consume around 1,700 metric tons of dry Artemia products which account for 50% of the global Artemia production. So if we look at um, the Artemia cysts demands by the aquaculture species, we can see that uh, almost uh, 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 three fourths of uh, uh, Artemia cysts goes to the shrimp hatchery, mainly the Panace shrimp, little Panace vename and about 15% of the cysts goes to the macrobrahim and Chinese midden crab, uh, Irohir sinensis, and also about 10% of cysts uh, goes to the marine fish, for example, the groupers and the solia uh, larvae culture. And more recently, uh, a demand has also uh, acquired by the uh, snail and also the large mouse um, bus uh, larvae culture. So over the decades, the status of the demands of the Artemia cysts uh, in China also has changed uh, from the seasonal requirement to the year-round requirement. And the, may, the main reason have also shifted from only south, for example, the Hainan province, the Guangdong province, and also the Fujian province, to the all over the China, the coastal line province, for example, um, uh, except for the south, also uh, the province in the north, the Shandong province, the Hebei province, and Tianjin city. And also the uh, hatching facility and also hatching techniques uh, for Artemia cysts have also uh, been significantly improved. Um, as you all know that um, Artemia, different Artemia cysts has their own characteristics in terms of biometrics uh, parameters, uh, the nutritional value and hatching performance from the different oranges. So there is also, uh, in fact, in China, a specific demands for the Artemia cysts from different oranges. Uh, according to the requirements of aquaculture species, for example, uh, marine fish larvae, they need Artemia cysts with uh, better separation between the shells, the nuclei, and unhatched cysts. In this aspect, the Artemia cysts produce uh, harvested from Tibet salt lakes, from a Russian uh, salt lake, Ibiet, has have a very good performance. And also Macrobrahim larvae, they prefer the faster swimming Artemia Nuclei, for example, the Artemia cysts from Bohai Bay uh, are preferred by the owner of the Macrobrahim hatchery, hatcheries. And also according to the hatching performance of the cysts, the Artemia cysts that can uh, tolerate higher hatching temperature are favored in the summer, for example, in, uh, in the summer in, in the southern part of uh, um, uh, China, for example, in Hainan province, and also the Artemia cysts that can tolerate lower hatching uh, salinity are favored by the region where only low, very low salinity seawater are available uh, in, the, in a certain season. Of course, better separation performance are always performed, uh, are preferred by the hatchery. And also the nutritional quality, especially the uh, EPA content in the Artemia uh, cysts and the nuclei are also uh, paid more and more attention, particularly in the marine uh, fish hatchery. But unfortunately, there is uh, usually no uh, intention for the nutritional enrichment in China nowadays. 
Okay, so um, when we talk about the hatching operation of the Artemia seeds in China, um, we talk about, uh, first we talk about within the hatchery, the, uh, the operation within the hatchery. So most of the time, the seeds are purchased by the hatchery and they hatch the seeds 24 hours before uh, the larvae uh, they, they used to they, they used the uh, the nuclei to feed the larvae. So there are different kinds of hatching facilities uh, for smaller scale, uh, 500 liter or bigger scale, uh, two uh, two thousand liter or, or five thousand liter, or also can be hatched in the concrete tanks. So the hatching can be done in general. Uh, direct hatching, just put the seeds in the seawater, or it can also be done. Um, it, it can also be conducted after the disinfection and also the decapsulation. Of course, the purpose of the, decaps uh, the disinfection is to limit the possible pathogenic uh, contamination uh, in the larvae culture. And for the control of the hatching condition, uh, the, te the temperature usually, uh, hatching temperature usually range from 22 to about 30 degree. Uh, if it's beyond this range, then the heating or cooling facilities are provided in the hatchery. Illumination is not necessarily given unless it's very dim inside the hatchery. So about the hatching operation, there's another way to operate the artemia, uh, to hatch the artemia nuclei. So we call it artemia, artemia nuclei hatchery. It, it's a new uh, business mode, in fact. The artemia nuclei are produced by the specialized company and the company uh, normally is situated nearby the hatcheries, the shrimp hatcheries or the fish hatcheries. And this kind of business started from 2005 in the south part of China. And nowadays it's spread everywhere uh, all over the China. And it's annually produced about 500 to 1000 metric ton nuclear biomass uh, with consuming about 150 metric tons of dry artemia cysts. And this business accounts for about 50 to 80% of total artemia nuclei demand in China. And the nuclei are sold in fresh with a very low, uh, uh, with lower uh, density, about half to, uh, uh, to one kilogram white weight per uh, 10 to 20 liter or in the uh, frozen uh, way, frozen products. There is an advantage and disadvantage of uh, operating this artemia hatching, uh, artemia nuclei hatchery. And the advantage is that we can use all kinds of artemia cysts, no matter it's in low quality or high quality, no matter it's in dry products or in wet products. And also the hatching are operated by the professionals and therefore it has a more uh, efficiency and also this kind of hatchery service to a small or medium size of a fish or shrimp hatchery and in this way to uh, reduce the cost for the labor and facility uh, cost in these hatcheries. The disadvantage of this hatchery is that usually the artemia nuclei are uh, harvest uh, to Insta3 and or even later uh, in order to get higher uh, hatching operate uh, output the production higher production but in this way it increased the risk of pathogen contamination and also reduce the energy value and also nutritional value of the nuclei so this is the disadvantage of the Artemia nuclei hatchery. And uh, now I would like to share information about how to uh, separate the Artemia nuclei with the cysts uh, shells. Um, 
So in China, normally we have a normal separation, like everyone, uh, I think most of hatchery um, used uh, all over the world. I will not repeat this, but uh, in China nowadays, um, the separation can also be improved by adding some chemicals to facilitate the separation. So we first also, after at the end of the hatching, the, we turn off the lights and stop the aeration. But at that moment, we add some chemicals. It can be uh, hydrogen peroxide, or it can be also sodium polycarbonate at a fi uh, five ppm. So uh, 10 more minutes later, the shells and the hatched cysts and the embryos uh, membranes are floating up to the surface and then we collect the, the nopia. So from this uh, picture, you could see that at your right hand, it's the uh, hatching uh, we, uh, before adding the uh, hydrogen peroxide. Afterwards, to your left uh, hand, you will see that there is a very good separation comparing to the one that uh, before we adding the uh, hydrogen peroxide. So uh, with this picture, you will see uh, more in details so that a good separation can be uh, obtained by adding chemicals. Next, please. So the next two slides, I'd like to share you some information about the uh, harvest of Artemia cysts in China. And this data were obtained from the uh, China, uh, uh, Artemia Association of China. So in, in fact, China, can annually produce uh, harvest about 1,200 to 1,500 metric tons, tons of raw product, um, ex uh, with an exceptional uh, year of uh, in, in 2016, where um, the Abbey Lake, the one of the major salt lake in China, they produced the extraordinarily large quantity of Artemia cysts. So normally we produce about uh, 1,200 1, to uh, uh, 1,500 metric tons of raw artemia seeds. Meanwhile, China also annually produce about 800 to 1,200 metric ton dry artemia products. So it means that we need to input, uh, to import some raw seeds from the other countries. Next, please. So this uh, table shows you the Artemia cysts import uh, from the other country, from Russia, from Kazakhstan, and from uh, Uzbekistan. So we are the largest importer of the Artemia cysts. Uh, uh, annually, we import about 2,000 to 3,000 metric ton raw Artemia cysts. And of course, we also uh, export uh, a certain amount of the final products to the other country, to the Vietnam, to uh, Malaysia, to Thailand, it is about 400 to 600 metric tons. So alternatively, the Artemia, there are also some other Artemia products applied in the hatchery. So first is the decapsulated Artemia cysts. Uh, there are two kinds of cysts can be decapsulated. First is the low quality cysts, uh, low hatching quality artemia cysts. So they are, after decapsulation, they are sold in dry products to mostly to the ornamental fish market. Uh, and also, there are also another operation for the normal hatching quality cysts. There are certain amount of this kind of cysts are processed as the decapsulated cyst product by a special lysed company, and they are uh, preserved very well in a cold condition and sold in white products to the hatchery. Well, when uh, in hatchery, in the shrimp and fish hatchery, they will continue hatch this decapsulated cysts to the Artemia nopliae. Next, please. So last but not the least, I would like to also mention about the utilization of Artemia biomass in the Chinese hatchery. So in China, uh, around 100,000 metric tons of Artemia biomass are yearly 
harvest, harvested from the uh, coastal salt ponds and also from inland salt lakes. And the Artemia biomass are produced in forms of frozen biomass, uh, fresh biomass, and also in some mainland province also produced in air dried way. And all this biomass, the frozen biomass, are sold as feed for pet fish, uh, uh, for pet fish and also for the shrimp nursery and broodstock mat maturation, and also as a formulated feed ingredients. So I thank you very much for your listening. Uh, thank you, Liying. Uh, next up from Greece, we have Dimitris Dimopoulos, sorry, uh, from Tappy's Hatchery of the Philosophish Company. Uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, Professor Patrick Sorgelos uh, for the invitation and also Nikos Papas and Isabella Represas from uh, INVE. Uh, okay, uh, a few words about uh, what we're doing here. Uh, we are a, a marine uh, hatchery with a Mediterranean species. We are producing uh, about uh, 25 to 35, 27, sorry, to 35 million fry per year. This is a sea brim and sea bass. Uh, the percentage of this, uh, of this species is uh, about 70% uh, of sea bass and the other uh, sea brim. We have an annual uh, consumption of Artemia about uh, three tons per year of Fiji and uh, another 300 uh, kilos uh, of uh, AF. Uh, we don't use any Artemia sub substitutions uh, in our protocols. Uh, next, please. Uh, we use uh, all of the Artemia we use is separate, uh, and the and the AG and the AF assists. Uh, uh, the minimum grade that we use is uh, more than two two hundred and ten thousand nafpli per uh, per gram. We have a water temperature system. Uh, our tanks are uh, two point five cubic meters cylindroconical, and for hats for the enrichment are the same. Uh, the maximum density for the hatching is uh, 650,000 cysts per liter, and for the enrichment is uh, 550,000 nafli per liter, but this depends also for the enrichment uh, product. Uh, we use different tanks for hatching uh, and enrichment. There is a standard time for hatching, this is 20 hours, and another 20 hours for the enrichment. We have an oxygen, the oxygen is control uh, manual. We measure it uh, about uh, every five hours. Uh, for the pH control, we are using uh, sodium bicarbonate to keep the, 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 the pH safe. And we, and we also measure the pH about uh, an hour to two hours after uh, we are putting the enrichment uh, media. Uh, we use a strong aeration with an open tube. The light at the surface is uh, about 2000 lux. And uh, for the for the harvest and the cyst, we're using an auto mag, and uh, we also uh, transferring the pumps with a pneumatic. Uh, sorry, we transferring the nafli with a pneumatic pump, and uh, then we the nafli storage at uh, four degrees uh, for keeping uh, the metabolism uh, low and uh, keep the the enrichment uh, in high levels. Uh, this is uh, how we. We have set up uh, the tanks. There is a, a, a temperature control uh, system. There is a boil water uh, circulated in this uh, uh, with, a, with a, a, a heater a sensor, and sensor for the temperature that keeps it at uh, 28 degrees. Uh, there is an oxygen diffuser. Uh, the air, then uh, the air, Air inlet pipe uh, is uh, outside the tank and in uh, the lowest uh, uh, point. Uh, and there is also a window for uh, the light uh, that uh, helps uh, for uh, separating uh, the, uh, the cyst from uh, the nafpli. Next. Uh, the water, the treatment for the water that we are using is uh, a system of uh, five microns uh, mechanical filter. Then is one micron, 
there's a, there is another run uh, of uh, 0.45 microns uh, cartridges and then an UV filter with uh, 150 millijoules per square centimeter dose uh, of uh, UV radiation. Uh, as uh, we are monitoring parameters like uh, oxygen, uh, temperature, as I have already uh, say, pH and the water quality with uh, analysis of the water once per month. Uh, for the enrichment, uh, we harvesting uh, enriching the tank uh, for the harvest uh, rinsing the nafli. Before harvesting, with uh, we turn off uh, the light and the aeration for ten minutes, and then starting uh, harvesting them, uh, incubating them in a new tank. Uh, we adding the enrichment in two doses. The first is uh, as, just uh, after we are putting them in uh, the tank and uh, the other uh, 10 hours later. Uh, we, for, after uh, emptying a tank, we wash it with a brush and a disinfectant soap and uh, rinse with treated water and then fill with treated water. And once a month, we disinfect all the uh, pipes of the water and the air that uh, brings the air and the water in the tanks. Uh, this is uh, a few photos from uh, the Artemia room in our hatchery. Uh, and uh, this is the control uh, panel of uh, the temperature. Uh, the tanks of uh, 205 uh, cubic meters cylindroconical. <laughs> Go on, and uh, for the last, uh, uh, yes, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, this is the pneumatic uh, pump and uh, the storage that we keep them in, uh, in four uh, degrees of Celsius. And, okay, and uh, this is a, a short video of the automac uh, working uh, and separating the cysts uh, from the NAFLI. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Demetrius. Uh, next up from Spain, we have Gustavo Espelata, the Fry Operations Manager from Avramar Company. Could you please start your presentation? Thank you, Simon. Thank you, uh, Patrick. We, we can go on. I mean, uh, we are going to use, to talk about the use of Artemia in, uh, in this case, in. You know, hatchery that we are producer of sea brim, sea bass, uh, and nigger. Here we uh, we you have a clear example of how it is the the feeding strategy for different for the different species. As you see, we are using uh, also other vector for the feeding that is uh, rotifers, and uh, we are introducing two types of artemia in the case of the brim and nigger, that is AF and AG. And uh, in the case of bass, we are also only using uh, AG. And the winning, when uh, the winning process, that is when we take a, take out uh, the Artemia feeding, it is depending on the manual, but more or less it's around 40 days post hatch until uh, 50 day, 55 days post hatch. Next slide. As I was commenting previously, the sea bass normally producer without uh, rotifers, only with AG. And uh, here uh, you have the 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 the, the images of uh, three of the three different species, the three different larvae, the how it is the control of live prey under the stereoscope. I mean, because one of the important things that we have to control it is how it is the intake, the the artemia intake in the the larvae. So um, we are controlling every day. That the, the larvae is taking the artemia. We are controlling the stores in the tanks, of course, and we are pushing the larvae to go to the early winning. Okay. Next slide. So, what are the pros and the cons of artemia, of using of artemia in the Mediterranean uh, aquaculture, at least for, for us? No? The pros, it is what we were talking during all this season, uh, during all this session, sorry, that. We have consistent results in survival and deformities is the main uh, vector that we are using for a long time. So it's, uh, this is totally clear. We have a good supply chain, so we don't have risk of that. And technically now it's easy to handle. 
And for the, from the other side, we have in the other hand, we have that the biosecurity is what we have. Um, uh, Patrick uh, have talked uh, at the beginning of the presentation about the vibrios, the cost also. Uh, we have the Artemia that has a, a higher price, the labor and the more complex installation that finally give us maintenance uh, cost. And also you have a risk that is possible, even if that is strange, that you can lose one tank or you have mortality in the Artemia and you lose some feeding, uh, feeding in the larvae. And this can be a risky situation for your production. So the question is, can we produce with Artemia, uh, without Artemia? And the, the, if you are telling me from the experiment, experimental point of view, at least in the, this three marine species, I will tell you that yes, if you are taking, uh, if you are asking me about the industrial point of view, I will tell you no. Uh, industrial industrial point of view is not an experimental plant, and we 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 want results. We want budgeted, and we want uh, something that uh, we have to produce the fees that we need for the production. So it's not going to be possible. So it's what I said here that you all the cons, the pressure to to reduce the Artemia poor consumption and to go to early wind uh, strategies, but uh, it's not very possible to have good results in survival and, and deformities to, to go that. Yes, there are, there are extreme manuals with low artemia consumption, but uh, with not very, with an unstable, uh, unstable results. So that's it's, uh, it's limiting. And basically that is, is, uh, is done because the efficiency uh, stomach of the species are involved in all, in all those, those processes. So the image that you, you can see here in the image where it is the open mouth, the open anus and the efficient stomach according one one study. So next slide. So in our daily routines, you know how we use the, the, the Artemia in the case of uh, our hatcheries is more or less what we were talking about and also what we need to explain uh, in the previous presentation. We are, we are every day we are counting the tanks. We are using in this, in all case, three cubic meter tanks. We are keeping in 30 degrees for the hatching. We are, it's 20 hours hatching. We are, we are keeping, uh, um, we, we, one important thing is that it is that we have the provision that we have to go and we have to consume. And uh, we are doing also a control of enrichment daily uh, by under the stereoscope and monthly by the uh, laboratory in order to check that the, everything goes uh, well. And after that, we are transferring, uh, after the harvest, we are transferring the, the Artemia to the cold storage in four degrees. And after that, we go to, to the library uh, also by uh, a pneumatic pump. And uh, about the KPIs in, uh, in, in our species, uh, we are uh, more or less to, to, to give you a, an idea. Uh, she brim it's around 50 kilos per million produced. So we are very far away from the stream. Also sea bass is around that. And uh, meager, we are in, uh, in 100. Meager, it's a gro fast grower species. We need uh, very high, let me say doses of, of, of Artemia, of high concentration of Artemia. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, next up from Ecuador, we have Stanislaus Son Sonnenholzer from CNAME. Uh, please go ahead. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this webinar on the use of Artemia seeds around the world uh, to share some of the information on the practices uh, that are carried out in the shrimp hatcheries of, of Ecuador. Um, next slide. Um, I, I would like to start this presentation by highlighting uh, the importance of shrimp production for Ecuador's economy. Um, the shrimp farming is one of the main non oil uh, uh, primary products that generates foreign exchange for 
Ecuador together with bananas. Uh, one of both products such as cocoa, coffee, and, 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 and fisheries. Um, although there are other aquaculture species that are uh, grown or produced in Ecuador, such as cobia and tilapia and other um, uh, fishes from the Amazon, uh, the production is marginal uh, compared to the shrimp production. And most of their artemiasis are used to feed the shrimp larvae. Um, <clears throat> um, artemiasis are mainly imported from either the Gra uh, Gra Great Salt Lake in, in, this, in the United States and uh, from several lakes of the Russian Federation. Uh, the importation of Artemia cysts has increased significantly in, in the recent uh, years, with about 200,000 uh, kilograms uh, being imported during the 2020. Uh, regarding the market share, about 60% comes from the Russian Federation and about 40% comes from, from, from the United States. Uh, the Undersecretary of Aquaculture of Ecuador has registered about uh, 386 um, shrimp uh, hatcheries. Of them, about 200 have legal agreement, while the rest uh, are in process of obtaining uh, authorization or the rest are about 100 or so are illegal. Um, it's estimated about uh, the production of about 80 billion uh, post larvae to see uh, about 218 uh, thousand shrimp production hectares. Next slide, please. Uh, in the following slides, uh, I'm just going to briefly present you some of the most common practices uh, in shrimp hatcheries of Ecuador for uh, the capsulation, incubation, harvest, disinfection, and storage of, of artemia cyst. Next slide, please. Uh, um, um, with regard to incubation, I have to say that about most of the of the artemia cysts are decapsulated. We will estimate about 98 of the, of the hatcheries uh, use decapsulated cysts for, the, for, shrimp, for feeding their, their shrimp larvae, and maybe less than 2% uh, uh, use direct incubation. Next slide, please. Uh, for the decapsulation, they use uh, usually commercial available chemicals, uh, commercial bleach, no? uh, and and sodium peroxide, 50% about the uh, active ingredient. Um, to handle those uh, chemicals, uh, they usually, the, the workers don't, they don't use uh, or handle the chemicals with, with any protection, usually either masks or gloves. So it's, it's very rare to, to see them handling these chemicals in, in, the, in the hatcheries. Um, during the process, they usually don't measure the chlorine activity, uh, and the way they uh, monitor the, 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 the capsulation, uh, usually they don't, they don't do it. They just see a change in color from, uh, from the brownish to, 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 to reddish. And that's the, the way they stop uh, uh, in, in, when they start to, to washing out the, the, the different cysts, um, the, the cyst. And they usually, as a, uh, they don't, after that, they don't, um, neutralize the chlorine and, and the effluents that are in during the washing are directly washed out into the, into the drainage. Um, you can see um, uh, doing this process either indoor or outdoor. Um, uh, you can see a couple of pictures over there where they do the hydration and then they use the... I have a couple of... I have two... Yes, next, next slide, please. Um, uh, 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 two, two videos, uh, if you can play them. Where, where you can see where, where they use, they have to prepare all these tanks and then they have the, the, the solutions, the chemicals, and they apply it to the, to the hydrated cyst. And then they start doing the, the washing in, the, in this type of, of system. No? And as you can see, they, they just wash out everything on the floor. Uh, with regard to the incubation, uh, we have different uh, types of, of, of tanks. They do it in different types of, of tanks. They can be rectangular concrete or, or, or fiberglass tanks. Uh, usually the, the, the volume is about between 500 liters to one ton tanks, uh, mostly conical. Um, and, 
So, uh, and so you can see in this picture the different settings that we can find in our in our hatcheries. Next time, next slide, please. Um, usually, uh, with regard to the temperature, they, with regard to the conditions or, or parameters uh, during the incubation, they usually don't heat the water. Uh, uh, they use uh, temperature, uh, ambient temperature, uh, so the temperature may change according to the season between 23 to 33 degrees centigrade. Usually the salinity is full strength seawater, what they collect from, 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 from the sea. They use, they use illumination, uh, usually those uh, LED lights uh, that have more than 2,000 lux. The pH of the seawater is between 7.5 to 8.1 uh, pH. They usually don't use any type of, of uh, sodium, uh, 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 I, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bicarbonate to raise the, the, the pH. They use usually oxygen, no? uh, they don't monitor the oxygen, just full, uh, uh, Mixing with 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 uh, with the, with the, with, the, uh, with the air stones, uh, they usually use this density of one gram per liter instead of two grams per liter, which, which is usually recommended by most of the textbooks. Um, and as I mentioned, the tanks can be cylindrical, but either with conical bottom or, or flat bottom, no. Uh, and the incubation is usually done performed between twenty four to thirty six hours. Next slide, please. Um, for the separation after after incubation to separate the, the nauplia the, the nauplia from the debris, you know, they, they, they use either uh, or mostly uh, hydrogen peroxide, 50% active ingredient, uh, to to separate them the embryo membranes and other floating debris. Uh, 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 so when they use uh, hydrogen peroxide, they, these debris uh, float and uh, nauplia. Uh, it's, it's on the bottom, and, and and then they just remove it from the from the surface after 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 stopping the aeration, and when they use uh, some some use also brine solution and and the, and the process is inverted so the the nauplia floats and the debris uh, sinks so uh, and that can be only and then they remove it by opening the valve and, and removing the bottom debris. Uh, next slide, please. Um, during the um, harvesting, uh, usually nauplia are directly collected from the hatching, 200 screen mesh, usually on the floor. Uh, they don't use any water bed. And uh, sometimes they use, I would say mostly they disinfect it either with formal or hydrogen peroxide at 50%. And there's a small video that can, how it's, how it's performed no? of one of those hatcheries. So it's directly collected from the from the hatching tanks into the into these meshes. Next slide, please. And yes, as I saw also in other in other in other countries, uh, they also mostly they, they kill or, or inactivate the, the nauplia after harvesting. They do it both. Some uh, put it in these plastic bags after after wedding. Usually they are one kilo bags, and they either put it in the freezer and, and for its further use, and some uh, kill it, and kill the the nauplia, or inactivate it by dipping them into into hot water or boiling water. And so there is a also to end a, a small video of you can see uh, how is how it's done. They have these <laughs> pots, right? boil the water, and then they they put the their timia bags. Uh, they leave it there for five to ten minutes. Uh, there's no control. They just assume that they are, they are dead after that dipping, and then they freeze it and uh, for for further use. That that's a common practice down here in, in in the shrimp farms, in the shrimp hatcheries. I'm sorry. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, we we'll thank uh, Maria Lourdes Cobo for for helping me in this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stanislaus. Our last uh, presentation for today is from Brazil. We have uh, Marcos Camara, who's professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, Brazil. 
where he teaches and does research and extension linked to marine sciences, mainly aquaculture. And we also have a video from Christine Macedo on behalf of Kamar Company and Aquatech Company. Okay, please go ahead. Greetings to everyone. And I will briefly review the status of Artemia cysts using shrimp hatcheries in Northeast Brazil. So in this picture, you see the production of Vaname postlarity. One characteristic is the large hatcheries, 20 large hatcheries. They have a capacity of production of 25 billion post larvae. Currently, the consumption is around 20 tons. 20% 20 of these 20 tons equal to four tons are harvested in local salt fields. Next, please. All right, so Brazilian shrimp hatcheries, they are quite large and use updated technology. Uh, they are well located and use ocean water, which facilitates the cleaning, washing, hatching process, which I will briefly uh, show to you in the next few slides, please. All right, in this table, you have a summary of hatching procedures in hatcheries in Brazil, uh, cis cleaning, disinfection, decapsulation, hatching. Uh, so maybe some variation here uh, regarding cis density from two grams per liter to five grams per liter. Uh, also some uh, variation regarding temperature but in general, the procedures are quite, quite well uh, applied and according to manuals and textbooks. Next one, please. All right. Pictures of disinfection and decapsulations, not different from what we have seen before here in this seminar. So concentrator for washing, for cleaning, for Raising uh, cysts, harvesting um, nuclei uh, before uh, storage. Uh, all right, um, maybe one difference from what we have seen here, except for one or two presentations, is the use of juvenile and adult Artemia biomass. They, as I have mentioned before, they are harvested in local salt fields. They are frozen, freeze-dried, or made into flake diets for larval, post-larval shrimp, as you see there on your screen. Next one, please. Uh, slide, please. Uh, oh, or, or, all right, uh, previous slide, I'm sorry, Patrick. Uh, so uh, although these quantities of Archemia biomice and the price are just a small fraction compared to cysts, price and quantity. Harvesting biomass represents a, a, an additional and more sustained income to fish folk. Next one, please. So finally, I'd like to make some recommendations or maybe just list the challenges ahead for optimizing cysts and biomass use in shrimp hatcheries in Northeastern Brazil. First, they need to standardize cyst decapsulation and cold storage practice. Also uh, to uh, pay attention to the development of nuclei stages. So uh, we could make sure that we should always uh, harvest the correct instar. Also pay very close attention to routine cleaning and disinfecting procedures before using cysts and biomass. And finally, uh, to further expand and consolidate biomass use. Uh, I'd like to thank you again and thank you and uh, 
all the best. Okay, thank you very much. So that was our last technical presentation. We've got two more things uh, to do tonight. One is uh, we're going to have a, a brief Q&A session now, and uh, then we've got sorry, a Sorry, brief... sorry, Simon. Sorry, yep. Simon, we still have Christina. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the video. Yes, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Patrick and Simon. Uh, for the next minutes, I will be, it will be my pleasure to show with you two videos for showing the use of Artemia in two Vonamese rectory in Brazil. The first one will be Aquatec. They are producing around 2 billion uh, PLs per year, just for your reference. You see that they have a large tank, around 4,000 uh, uh, liters. They also use uh, separate technology, but is still using the former technology with the, the blue tube. You see that it's only one person working over there. Now Tecmaris, both ones are located in Rio Grande do Norte state, and they produce around 3 billion uh, PLs per year. This with carboys, 500 liters uh, each one. Now with the new technology, CSTM also with separate technology.
Thank you, Patrick. Okay, uh, thank you for the video, Christine. Uh, we're going to go into the uh, Q&A session, which is our last session for today. Uh, our panelists have been busily typing answers to your questions, so if you have typed a question into the box, uh, have a look. You may find that you've got an answer. Most of them have been answered already. But I, I'd like to ask our, uh, our panelists now uh, if there's any questions that you would like to address verbally. Uh, please just open your microphone and make yourself known. Have any of our panelists got a, a question they'd like to answer? I have not been able to. Uh, I had to look at the screen and <laughs> couldn't chat, couldn't look at the chat box or the Q and A session. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There, there is one uh, question here. Maybe anybody can answer. So from Anastasius, Anastasius. So how can we take out the glycerol? from maybe from the seeds or from the uh, nuclei so that it cannot be a substrate for Vibrio, which it, so it cannot be a carrier of pathogenic Vibrio when you use artemia nuclei. Well, we can uh, we cannot prevent uh, the release of the glycerol because it is playing a crucial role in uh, getting the cysts up to the breaking stage. Uh, it is indeed a problem when uh, you were um, postponing the harvesting of the nobli until they are in an instar two. But as we have seen, and um, I think this is where there is a lot of room for improvement. If you harvest the artemia in the instar one stage, you can clean them, you can wash them, and they have not been able to ingest any vibrio as long as they have not molted into the second instar stage. Uh, another question from Sri uh, Washuningsi. Uh, how to maintain the quality of instar one and how to know that the quality is still good or not before you use it? Anybody uh, from the experts? Uh, can I answer? Sure, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, I think we, uh, in a vehicle, uh, after we hatching, we collect a sample to calculate how many uh, nuclei uh, were done. And that time we check, uh, we have a, a program to have a picture and to to call and to have a look, uh, how many of the inter one, how many we inter two. So in the future, we have a program to do that. So very easy for us. And now only few, uh, few percent of, I think that month, only two or three percent of the inter two, on of them we inter, inter one. So it's quite good for us, yes. We uh, look next micro -call. Yeah, next to that, I like to say that, and as we have seen for uh, some, Cold storage is really a handy technique to ensure that you keep the animals in Instar 1. Uh, it can be at very, very high concentrations, 5,000 and more per milliliter, uh, at the temperature of 4 to uh, 8 degrees centigrade. For a period of 24 hours, they remain in that uh, Instar 1 stage. Uh, the technique that we have seen uh, of boiling uh, the artemia I think this is where there is a real problem that um, uh, Artemia nuclei uh, will be mechanically damaged. You have leaching. That means that you will also have uh, a substrate for uh, uh, Vibrio development in the hatchery tanks. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is a good practice. And I like to refer to the presentation of uh, uh, Hua, and I hope he is still here. Maybe he can give further comments. Uh, I think there are very good opportunities for shrimp hatcheries to apply what is done in Vietnam with the umbrella artemia. 
Umbrella Artemia, you were even earlier in the larval development and uh, could feed then indeed uh, a non-moving Artemia prey because uh, killing it by freezing or uh, uh, um, boiling is to be able to feed them in an earlier larval stage. Feeding them in an umbrella is what is done in practice in uh, Vietnam. Koala, would you like to add anything? Uh. Uh, before you answer Hua, yes. uh, since we are already talking about the umbrella stage, there's one question here. How mm -hmm. to harvest umbrella stage Artemia for mud grub or for any hatchery maybe? Uh, can it be complete? Com can it be a complete substitute for rotifer as first food for soya one in mud grub? Uh, in fact, uh, in uh, mud grub hatchery in Vietnam, can you hear me, Patrick? Yep. Yes. Okay, that's uh, fine because <laughs> I'm still in doubt with my computer, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, in the mud grub hatchery in Vietnam, normally that when we do the incubation of uh, artemisis, and uh, a, in my presentation, you try to uh, keep the incubation process up to 12 or 14 hours, and then you stop aeration. In that moment, then you can see the umbrella stay where the embryo, they just stay beneath of the empty cyst. And what the technician or the people in the hatchery doing, they try to do the separation. So in that moment, for sure that the percentage of uh, umbrella stay, they stay uh, sometimes 80% or even higher. It depends on the seed quality. And in that case, by stirring the water in the hatching con, then finally that you, you can end up with very good separation of uh, umbrella stay. Then you can collect it, uh, wash it, uh, before to fit into the larvae tank. That's what uh, people in the mud trap uh, actually usually doing nowadays in uh, in Bạc Liêu, in the Mekong Delta. So do you, do, can you uh, substitute it uh, totally for the rotifers? So can you use the umbrella stage instead of rotifers? Uh, in this case, you have to look at the specific strain and tend to the uh, Vinchau strain uh, they have quite small uh, dimension compared to the other. So therefore, when we apply the umbrella stay of Vinchow strain, immediately that you can re replay up to 100% of protifer, no problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah a question from Wang Lei. Uh, since uh, Artemia nuclei may not contain enough essential fatty acids for fish and shrimp, uh, he is questioning about Artemia enrichment, which was not mentioned in any of the presentation. So is Artemia enrichment uh, not common practice in the countries before feeding it to the fish shrimp, fish or shrimp larvae? A anyone can answer. So uh, it's me, uh, from Thailand. Uh, for I think it depends on the, the species that uh, we feed uh, Artemia to because uh, in Thailand now, when we are uh, now we produce more on Phenomai, which uh, we can culture it in the low salinity. So for the enrichment, it not, uh, has uh, any uh, significant uh, difference for the performance of trim compared to uh, Monodon. And also for the sea bass. They are so is uh, the other mud fish which can uh, raise in fresh water. So it can feed on uh, like uh, live food in uh, that we produce from fresh water. So uh, for the artemia, we no no need for the enrichment of artemia in sea bass. So I think it depends on the species that we culture. Thank you. I'd like to add a few uh, uh, points here as well that. Uh, in general, Artemia used, uh, people look for the more smaller size it is. So that's why the strain, which is more smaller and uh, and the nutritional value, that's the way it look for. So when we talk about enrichment, it is also the later stage of Artemia and its size is bigger. 
So of course the enrichment technique, which is very great, but I think the far further work is really required to see that uh, what are the things we are enriching for. That's the way we can use this technique for maybe for uh, disease prevention, maybe for um, for other purposes, or also as uh, Montakin mentioned that the purpose. So because it is the size is bigger, so maybe for brood stock or for other, it's not really for larval feeding. Thank you. Maybe Gustavo or Dimitris, you want to uh, comment because enrichment is routine application in uh, European hatcheries? Yes, enrichment, uh, that's uh, in order to, to uh, it, it was proof that uh, in order to avoid the deformity and problems, we have to uh, to stabilize the nutritional value of the Artemia. And this, uh, the best uh, the best way to do it, it is with the enrichment products and the enrichment stage. So that's, uh, and that is common, common uh, practice in all the marine hatcheries. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with this. I, I don't have something uh, more on this. Yes. Simon, how many minutes do we still have for the open forum? Not too many more. We've kind of <laughs> gone over time. Maybe we could do one more question if, if, if we have one. Yeah, uh, Patrick, this is for you. Is there any method we can use to maximize synchronous hatching of Artemia cyst? Yeah, sorry, Ed, you were breaking up there. Okay, sorry. Uh, for, for Patrick, uh, is there any method we can use to maximize synchronous hatching of Artemia cyst? Well, uh... Uh, first of all, applying the uh, good light conditions, because if light conditions are not optimal, it means that uh, the start of the metabolism will be spread over a longer period of time and your synchrony will be less. Um, pH, but there are indications that also when you were out of the optimum range, that this might have an impact on the synchrony. But uh, it is a fact that from one strain to another, from one species to another, that the hatching synchrony is different, but you can optimize it by working in the optimum uh, uh, water, water, uh, uh, water conditions, uh, the parameters for water condition. Maybe just one last question, uh, sure, Simon. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, this is from Seeing Lee on the use of magnetic separation technique. Can you expound this uh, a bit uh, more on how? The magnetic separation uh, technique or uh, magnetic separation method is functioning for the separation of uh, unhatched cyst and uh, nuclei. I think this is for. Uh, is the question for me? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Hello? for you. Is, I think for. Is uh, it for me? Yeah, anybody, maybe for you and maybe for Christine also. Yeah, but for me, because um, I, I did not mention about the magnetic, uh, magnetic separation uh, of the unhatched cysts and uh, uh, nuclei. So in fact, I introduced uh, another uh, technology is kind of uh, by adding uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide or the uh, sodium per carbonate and to uh, improve and to facilitate the separation of the uh, unhatched cysts, the, the empty shells uh, with the Artemia nuclei. Yeah, I, th I think we saw the magnetic separator from the video the of uh, Christine. Yeah. Maybe Christine, can you elaborate on this magnetic separation? Okay, uh, actually, uh, this technology adds a, a kind of coating to the, the cysts, provide a kind of, a, I would say, a unique feature to the shell. So the corium has a special, this special feature that it's been attracted 
by the magnets. So the eggs that uh, are hatched uh, are being retained by the equipment. So you have a perfect separation to, uh, from shells and eggs. This is the basic uh, principle of the SEPAR technology. Maybe Patrick could add something if uh, he wants. Patrick? Oh, uh, well, um, I think you have uh, described it perfectly, Christine. It's in the uh, Corion that uh, um, um, uh, iron particles can be coated and uh, trapped so that later uh, uh, upon the hatching, you can separate the empty shells or even the full cysts that have not hatched from uh, the nuclei or from the uh, umbrellas. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much to all of the panelists and experts. And there's still some quest few questions on the Q&A box and we, uh, you can type, uh, you can answer any of the questions by typing because of the time limitation. Simon, over to you. Uh, yes, uh, so the last thing we have on our agenda is a, a poll. Uh, we'd appreciate your if uh, people could help answer or provide a little bit of data on uh, a few questions for us. We'd value your input. Um, so I'm just going to launch it now and uh, I think we can work through this quite quickly. Uh, so all the participants are encouraged to answer the poll, please. Yeah, has it appeared on screen yet? I think I got it. Yes, different yes, it's, it's on the screen now. Okay. And people can just scroll through the poll and uh, fill in one or more boxes, depending if it is uh, one choice or multiple choice. So the first question, Simon, is uh, before attending this webinar, did you know about the difference between INSTAR1 and INSTAR2? It's just a yes or no question. And question two is before uh, this webinar, did you know that INSTAR2 can ingest Vibrio and can be carriers of uh, possibly pathogenic Vibrio species? Okay, we are having some answers now. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all, all the participants can answer. Do we press the submit at the end or we do that by question? No, it's it's by question, uh, Patrick. Okay, uh, question three, from what organization are you from? Question four, how are Artemia products related to your work? Question five, what species do you use Artemia cyst for? And I suggest uh, we can go more slowly. Yeah, because uh, I think they can scroll the, the, the questions, yeah. yeah. Because uh, we are receiving already uh, answers from all the posted questions. So we have a total of nine questions. Maybe I need to inform the other panelists that we as panelists, we cannot uh, participate yes. in the poll. <laughs> this, is, this is only for the participants. Okay, we've got 50 responses. Thank you. If uh, I'll leave this up for another couple of minutes. Yeah. 
and it is now 60. And we'll give it one more minute. It's slowing down a bit now. Okay, that's a hundred. All right, I'll close the poll in a, in a few more seconds and uh, then we'll go on to the uh, conclusion, which will be by uh, the NACA Director General, General uh, Huang Ji. Okay, if you've got any more, any more contributions, just click your buttons. All right, that will do. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, Wang Ji, uh, could you please give the uh, conclusion? Okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, come to the end of the program. I would like to thank all of you to participate in and contribute to uh, this webinar. Uh, and also, I would like to propose that uh, following uh, persons, we are working with uh, NACA to prepare the uh, report for this uh, NACA ATMIA webinar to be presented at the GCA uh, ATMIA webinar. Uh, I suggest the Professor uh, Patrick Suglos, Professor Lian Sui, Professor Mizada uh, Raman, Ram, uh, the draft report will be circulated among all webinar participants for final approval. And uh, if you don't have uh, uh, other opinion, then we will close the uh, the program. On behalf of the NACA. Secretary Ren, I would like to thank you, your, our expert uh, speakers, the International Akimia Agriculture Consortium, and uh, Professor Patrick Suglos for sharing the time with us today. We appreciate it very much. I would like to suggest that the panelists from a, a committee to write uh, the report of the meeting that can be tabled, tabled for uh, consideration at the 
forthcoming SDG aligned uh, Artemia workshop, which will be held on 22 September in conjunction with the Global Conference on Agriculture later this, mo this month. There are many follow-up actions that could be considered, considered, such as updating the FAO 9 menu, local language training workshops, or the use of uh, online multimedia uh, training materials. We will, uh, Andy, and Andy will to post a recording of this webinar on NACA's YouTube channel. We will send, send an email to all participants with the link to view this video in due course. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, G. So uh, that's the end of Thank it. Uh, Patrick, Thank do you have you anything much. you'd like to add? Well, uh, just to say that uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, NACA again for taking the initiative, uh, especially thanks to uh, all the panelists, the time that they have taken in uh, uh, preparing the presentation and especially also in contacting. I know that many of you uh, have done a lot of efforts uh, to uh, contact different hatcheries, collect material, collect data. So I think that was a very good overview. Thank you all and uh, uh, good evening, good afternoon, um, and yeah, still good morning for Latin America. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm staying, I'm staying. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch with an email email link for the uh, videos from this uh, in probably next week or something. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia and Simon. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.